Steve's work. Uh, when I came to Steve in the early 90s, uh, uh, Ken Simons was working on his dissertation, and he and Steve, I think it was you and Steve, had put together a, a group of, of industries and had looked at it for the first shakeouts. And one of the things that Steve said to me when I came as a, as a graduate student and a research assistant, he said, well, there's a couple of these that don't show a, 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 a shakeout. I want you to start digging into those. Uh, I think I had the choice between tape recorders, um, I can't remember what else, but lasers is what I ended up with. And from that, we still couldn't find sort of immediate shakeouts and started breaking it into submarkets. And so that was my first exposure to uh, Steve and submarkets. And it actually built into a lot of the work that we ended up doing on spin-offs within entrepreneurship. Um, so with that, we have three speakers. Um, who's going to be first? Ramel. 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 Yeah. Okay. Party in. Okay. Ramel. Okay. Okay. Oh, you guys are fine. Hello. I can't hear you. I think you have to speak to the you know microphone. Yeah, we're ready to go, Ramel. Okay, fantastic, fantastic. I I, I couldn't hear anything back there, but uh, you know. Thank you so much, David and Francisco, for organizing this, the conference. And uh, I wish I could be there, you know, in person. But uh, they, you know, would have it. You know, my passport is in Ottawa. That's probably not a good idea to cross the border without my passport at this point. Um, but uh, thank you, Ed, uh, for helping out with the presentation. And uh, you know, I'll tell you that I've never presented over a kind of conference, so this is. It's going to be quite an experience. Um, and uh, I really got quite a lot on the slides in case you can't hear me. Uh, I hope you, you'll be able to piece this and read the slides and uh, follow the presentation. Uh, David and I talked about uh, a paper that would be befitting to you know, this occasion. And uh, uh, we thought, you know, why not something to set up in auto? Uh, the two you know, topics that were very close to Stephen's heart. Um, next slide, please. And, you know, when we're talking about this spin off process, uh, let me tell you about this spin off process and this project that I had with Nick Archer. Well, uh, obviously, I am a in a clever spin off. Clever um, was my thesis advisor. I wrote the, the, my thesis on, on diamond industry in Bangladesh under his supervision. Um, and, uh, you know, I remember still so vividly to this day, you know, where, you know, he would sit uh, there, and then I'd sit right across him by the round table, and then we'll talk about uh, for hours um, on the literature and, you know, the gaps in the literature, some of his work and potential research questions. Um, well, really, you know, I, I mean, I reflect on this now, and, you know, my good friend who was at a competing institution uh, and uh, actually writing a piece for someone else, uh, he actually had only five minutes. He'd been lucky to have you know, five minutes with his advisor, um, um, you know, in, in a month. And he, he told me that, well, I have to really memorize things to go to my advisor and, uh, you know, talk about my uh, project and here Steve was, you know, so caring and uh, uh, selfless and, you know, spent hours uh, in imparting, you know, the wisdom that he had. So it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a great experience that I, I take from uh, Carnegie Mellon and that I'm very proud of. Now, another, you know, selfless act is here, you know, uh, for this particular project is that Stephen gave the data on office to us, um, my uh, um, partner in crime here is Nick Archer, and uh, he, he gave this spin off data on office to us, and he told me that, well, Ramon, maybe, you know, you're on the survey here, just keep me posted. Um, unfortunately, you know, he didn't live um, enough to see the results. So, what, what do we get to the paper? Um, next slide, please. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, good. So, it, it, we, we know a lot about spin-offs. I mean, Clipper and Clipper spin-offs have uh, 
establish, you know, the regularities. And uh, when I want to acknowledge also what she and her set up also has uh, been a powerhouse in this uh, literature, advancing this literature. And we know set up a substantial source of interest for a key role in industry and agglomeration. Uh, there is to have in a superior performance. Uh, and it's been argued that it's still not exploring industry specific knowledge of their founders who presumably gained it while working at incumbents. And the idea here is that, you know, spin off have this knowledge inheritance, which other engines lack, and that's the reason why they actually have superior performance. But I think, you know, there's still black black box here in the sense that, you know, how does an apparent capability influence spin off knowledge inheritance or application of knowledge inheritance for that matter? And, you know, how does uh, the knowledge in the head in turn contribute to the of the performance? We don't know much about that process at all. So, what are we going to do in this paper? So, let's move on to the next slide. So, we're going to focus on you know, key value chain activities. And by a key activity, and we're saying that you know, it enables the firm to create and capture substantial value. It's pretty you know, generic, and we want to keep the theory a little, uh, you know, open. Um, and the idea is that, you know, we, we care about, uh, you know, activities that have measurable impact on firm performance, right? And the reason why we want to study the determinants of early integration choices at the level of individual key activity is that it, they can reveal the application of the firm's initial capabilities. And we know studies from you know, Connie's work and other people's work that initial capabilities can lead to these past dependent you know, uh, capability, de uh, capability development, which then leads to superior performance. So what we have here is, you know, what we're, we're trying to do is that whether you know, knowledge inheritance or uh, you know, really influences these key activities, which are represented by these uh, triangles within a firm, which is a circle, and, uh, you know, when you think about, the, you know, when you're integrating an activity within a firm, you also have to think about, you know, the transaction cost argument. So, uh, we're going to take that into account as well. But we want to, obviously, are interested in knowing about performance. And performance is a relative term, and then it depends on competition. And there's this whole, you know, literature, you know, Porter and others that talk about, you know, the firms create and capture value to the differentiation of plus leadership solutions. Um, so, next slide, please. So, what we have here is basically we're speaking to three different literature, and it's actually been developed um, in isolation, and what we have in here is a way to link them. And uh, let, let's move ahead you know, in the interest of time, and we can come back to some of this later. So, next slide, please. So what essentially we're doing is that we're trying to refine the idea of knowledge in heaven. So <laughs> think about the pen firm and the spin up firm there. What the current literature says that, well, you know, there's some knowledge in heaven from the pen firm to spin up. This is the arc, the blue arc arrow that goes from the pen to spin up. But what we want to look at is whether, you know, a key activity, which is represented by this red in a triangle, whether the spin off key activity is, is that it, it is actually doing in the house is actually influenced by whether the pen also has integrated that key activity. In, in other words, what we're trying to link is we're going really narrow here and looking at these key activities and trying to establish a link between pen capabilities to spin off capabilities. And then we can compare, you know, whether it's spin off that are inheriting. This, uh, in, in a knowledge about this particular key activity, are actually more likely to integrate the non spin off or even the spin offs that don't have parents that are doing that particular activity. And then, of course, what we want to link it to is basically whether you know, the, the integration of that key activity then leads to the firm to choose certain specific positions. And thereby, you know, uh, in particular, whether it is inheriting spin up by carrying out the activity established in a more defensible strategic positioning, and therefore, you know, outperform other entrants. So, next slide, please. Um, you know, the rest of the talk is pretty standard. I 
I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the series. The more interesting part is going to be talking about the data, you know, uh, auto industry, got some integration uh, data here, which I think would be interesting to the people, uh, you know, the scholars who have spoken earlier today this morning, and so uh, we're going to try to spend more time there. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so we will first consider the determinants of integration of the key activity. So we know that convention costs depend on asset specificity of the activity. And uh, more interestingly, we know that knowledge transfer occurred from incumbent to employee spin off. And what we're suggesting is that the underlying knowledge relevant to key, uh, carrying out a key activity in house is more likely to have been transmitted through the spin off process than the parent also carried that key activity. In other words, the idea is that if you're paying for an in, in a set of activity, there's more chances that you actually work in that particular key activity. So this knowledge inheritance in turn is expected to influence you know, the set of own decision to internalize the activity in question. And then we're going to account for the specificity in that transaction. So we're going to take into account of the you know, transaction cost uh, uh, consideration. So two hypotheses come up right away. Uh, spin up bond for a parent firm that integrates a key activity is more likely to integrate that activity than the non spin up. Spin up bond from a parent firm that integrates a key activity is more likely to integrate that activity than a spin up of parent firm did not integrate that activity. So we're going at this, you know, this that activity level analysis here. Now, there can be uncertainty surrounding the activities that turn out to be key, but it turns out that uh, the inclusion of the uh, Uncertainty does not change our predictions. And suppose there's no uncertainty at all about what these key activities are, and they all the firms know what they should uh, integrate. Then, if you assume some imperfections in the labor market, you're going to get the same um, hypothesis. So, let's move on to the next slide. Um, next, we consider the influence of uh, carrying out a key activity on a firm's strategic position, and then we're going to link it to firm's performance. Um, and, and you know, we know that firms create capture value through differentiation, lower cost, or a combination of those um, strategic positioning assets. But I think the key interesting thing here is that uh, it's strategic positioning. Uh, you know, there's this work that suggests that uh, you know, if you are going to have a strategic positioning, it has to be supported by the underlying capabilities. In other words, you know, if, if you think about Tesla, and uh, it's got some capabilities in, um, um, in electric uh, uh, engines and batteries, then you expect that, in, you know, they would have this capability then which you might see that there's going to be an integration choice that they're going to make and that's going to respect that capability. Uh, but the firm performance is also affected by the service competition and the choice of strategic uh, position. And that sense that, you know, um, if, if you think that Tesla has already cornered the market of premium electric cars, then BMW might want to go into, uh, instead of going into competing head on with Tesla, where the competition is going to be feared, maybe, you know, what they did with i3 went into, uh, you know, the 40,000 price category or is it a higher category, which is 130 plus with their i8. A different market uh, positioning that, that they have done. So the idea here is that when capabilities are leveraged to enter more successful strategic positions, which are prone to less you know, competitive uh, firms, then you know, that's what they expect is the positive influence or rival. And two you know, arguments come out very clearly is that because the firm's capabilities are affected in the integration of the key activities expected to contribute to the establishment of its defensible strategic positioning, and because knowledge and inheritance is expected to influence the integration of the activity, it follows then the integration of the key activity, and I'm just going to read this out uh, uh, because uh, this is probably the best way to explain it. Uh, the integration of the key activity that is stimulated by the set of knowledge and inheritance contributes to the defensible strategic positioning, and the strategic positioning that is made defensible by the integration of the key activity which in turn is stimulated by the spin of knowledge inheritance, increases its survival time. So in other words, we're just linking you know, uh, knowledge inheritance to key activity and then strategic positioning to survival. Now, obviously, as these arguments are suggest, the firms are making these strategic choices uh, simultaneously. Um, and so uh, one of the 
key issue to consider here would be, in, you know, the simultaneity that may be in these joint decisions. And to the extent that we can, uh, we will try to put uh, to deal with this empirically. Uh, and then, you know, have some uh, uh, historical evidence to uh, provide support uh, if you have alternatives uh, that pop up on China, you know, to throw back some feathers. Uh, moving on, next slide, please. Um, and by the way, I am doing extremely well. Um, so the test that we have is the early U.S. auto industry. Uh, the industry tested by rapid technological change, this high variation in differentiation and performance uh, in, in this industry, turn up their abundance. Um, and really uh, interesting that uh, there's enthusiasm in this uh, industry that kept track of different components of cars. So uh, I'll tell you more about the data, but here's the trend in, um, uh, in a integration or disintegration of major components that we see. You know, we have data from 1917 to 1931. And what you notice is that while other, you know, transmission clock steering plane, you know, more or less, you know, uh, there's, uh, they might even go into more vertical disintegration engines so over time is becoming more and more integrated. Now, why might that be? Let's move on to the next slide. Ramal, you have five minutes. Okay, so uh, engines, especially large engines, are complex, so there might be some transaction cost estimates. Um, engines, more importantly, are actually becomes very key to differentiation, and this is particularly important because the industry faces intense competition at this time from the introduction of Ford in a Ford Model T at the low price segment. So, you know, what is interesting, and you know, we're talking earlier about the evolution of the industry and integration, um, and the context is important. In this case, what really happens is that a Ford, a, the a strategic decision of Ford is actually pushing software to do a different thing. So, so uh, let me give you more, more context about engines. Um, and, you know, the next slide, please. Um, you know, they're featured prominently in the advertisements. So here's Chandler, don't ever bet your, uh, you can beat a Chandler up a hill because at that time you have to remember that the cars, the quality of engines and quality of cars were, you know, debatable and whether the cars could actually go uphill, um, engines would break down, uh, you know, a lot. And so really having the capability to have these engines can actually help you differentiate from the rest of the pack. Next slide, please. Uh, so we're talking about a completely cushioned engine. Next slide, please. And uh, this is uh, Cadillac, which is uh, um, you know, the founder of Leland, who, who actually designed engines for Cadillac and is a spin off and uh, found uh, Lincoln. And uh, Lincoln is, uh, uh, you know, we designed the V8 engine, so we know it's a very successful term that gets brought up by Ford. Next up, slide, please. And Duesenberg, that's another successful spin-off that we know. Next slide, please. And here's what we're trying to do. Um, you know, achieve on the uh, change decision here. It's aging in how to offer key strategic positioning and car price. And here's the way to conceptual strategic positioning. The idea is that, you know, as you have competition coming in uh, as a low price segment, the agency will allow you to move up and differentiate and move away from uh, uh, the competition from Model T and you know, secure more defensible strategic position. So next slide, please. Uh, and this is the data that we have. Uh, Bigelow also gave us the data on entry and exit, and then we got this data from um, uh, Mr. Steele and others on uh, components. We sent it to India, and then we coded everything back in here and linked 10 component profiles with spin off at the time of entry. Next slide, please. Now, uh, obviously, the issue is that, you know, um, uh, you know, we've argued that the integration of a key activity stimulated by knowledge and heritage, this is a strategic position which in turn contributes to survival. So we have to estimate three equations, integration, market positioning, and survival. The problem is if we do it independently, error curves may be correlated, and particularly, you know, on a board of entrepreneurial authority, may be correlated with integration, positioning, and survival. 
So, what we do is we actually follow Woolwich, uh, actually we set our own book, and then uh, Nickerson, Hamilton, uh, and what are actually uh, link market position and vertical integration. So we actually follow their strategy as well, and the key assumption that we make, uh, and that is the next slide, please, uh, is that, uh, let me, um, let's see, I'll click on this slide here. Um, and capabilities and transaction cost considerations do not have a direct effect on switching and positioning of performance, but it's very, very important to the integration of the key activity in question. Transaction cost in these, um, um, you know, uh, strategic positioning literature don't really say much about one another, but the key thing here is that our theoretical argument has an important implication, which is that it suggests that a firm's strategic, strategic positioning and performance are linked to the underlying capabilities reflected in the integration of the key activity. So we would expect that both client capabilities and transaction costs will influence the integration decision, but they will influence positioning and firm performance in so far as they contribute to the capabilities reflected in the integration. So what we do is that we first estimate uh, integration with proxies for private capabilities and transaction costs, and a whole bunch of control variables, and then we will explore these, uh, those processes in the subsequent estimation uh, of, uh, vertical, uh, of strategic positioning and uh, survival, but we're going to put in the predicted values of the vertical integration to survival and uh, into strategic positioning and the predicted values of strategic positioning into survival. So let's move on to the next slide. This will be clear. I want to keep the focus on model one, and this is where you know we are predicting whether the uh, entrant vertically uh, integrates or not. So what you find is that if a spin off is paired off the integrated engine, if the more likely to integrate than the non spin off, which is the baseline category, um, and parent spin off that parent uh, with parent that out this engine, they're no more likely to uh, you know integrate uh, as the non spin off. And we know also uh, that you know, this coefficient estimate of parent engine outsource um, and the difference between parent engine in-house and parent engine outsource is statistically significant. So we have, have uh, you know, uh, five support for hypothesis 1A and 1B. And moving on to the next uh, model, model 2, now we're going to use the predicted value uh, of vertical integration into uh, in a market segment. And we find that to be, you know, statistically significant. So from the results one and two would suggest that, you know, um, a vertical integration stimulated by, you know, uh, knowledge inheritance uh, leads to this uh, more detectable strategic positioning. Then we do the same with the four survival years, and we have different measures of survival years. And in a predicted loss price, which is the, you know, proxy for uh, detectable strategic positioning, picks up there as well. So, um, so let me try to wrap up very quickly. I mean, you know, the next slide, please. Um, you know, uh, this is, it depends on, you know, the empirical technique, it depends on some key assumptions, and this is based on uh, taste. But if we were to not to think about these, uh, you know, strategic choices and just want the good of, you know, survival analysis, then we could look at the, um, you know, uh, the moderation effect between Vertical integration and um, um, and uh, vert uh, vertical integration and the uh, uh, price, and what we find is that uh, you know uh, uh, vertical integration uh, uh, of that key activity which is ancient is moderated by the price segment that you're in, and this coefficient estimate, this moderation coefficient estimate, is actually uh, in a higher than the uh, for spin off than the non spin off that also integrate uh, in house. So let's move on to a couple of slides. Uh, I want to push through and you know, if there are alternative explanations, I will come back to these slides. And uh, maybe I think that I, I am sort of out of time, so I'm just going to finish by pointing out to the key contribution down there, which is our study tries to develop a key conceptual link between experience, experience, production, cost economics, and strategic positioning. Try to open up the box of you know what really these spin-offs are trying to do. Let me stop here because I think I'm out of time. Yeah, thank you, Ramal. Just be clap for a minute.
Excellent. So thank you, everyone. Good afternoon. I um, want to take a moment to obviously thank the organizers. As a former student of Stevens, I wanted to say, you know, on, on behalf of the students, I think it's we really appreciate all of us being able to come back um, and, and participate in the day, given that so many of us weren't able to get back, um, you know, a year and a half ago. So really appreciate you including us in the event. Um, I want to take some time to talk specifically about semiconductors. So we've heard about a bunch of the other clusters. Um, part of my uh, doctoral work was around the semiconductor industry, specifically in Silicon Valley. Um, and so Francisco and I are going to take you through some, some material today. Cristobal is also an author. Um, and we have plenty of initial guidance from Stephen as well, which you'll see as we go forward. So when we say input from Stephen, um, I don't know how many of you have collaborated with Stephen, but I'm pretty sure this was delivered uh, during one of our Sunday morning meetings around that round table that, that Ramel referred to. Um, which was, you know, Stephen saying, oh, I thought about it for like five or 10 minutes, and, and here's what I've come up with for an outline. So uh, this is the initial guidance from Stephen. The, the work has largely followed uh, his initial thoughts. That was only five pages, right? five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so Stephen's input is in here for sure. So why are we interested in, in Silicon Valley, right, in the area around San Francisco? It's certainly not because of the area, right, in terms of mass. Um, it's a very tiny area we're talking about, but as we've seen throughout history, right, we've seen the emergence of tons and tons of firms there. Um, as we think through specifically semiconductors in the US, which early on uh, Silicon Valley was well known for, it's now transitioned to other industries, um, you see that within a period of, of 30 or so years, it amasses approximately half of the market share. At the same time, Silicon Valley is growing from 300,000 people up to 1.3 million. Right? So it's clearly a very interesting region with lots of activity going on, and we want to understand more about Silicon Valley's emergence, um, which is why we're doing the work. So you'll see a more modern uh, mapping of Silicon Valley with a bunch of logos you probably can't read. Um, but basically, it all starts with the semiconductor. right? And we'll, we'll go through a bit of the story there um, around what's happening to really drive the growth in Silicon Valley. So the semiconductor industry itself right, uh, really begins with the advent of the transistor Bell Labs. What you see here on, the, on this graph is basically how the distribution of that industry is changing over time. So Silicon Valley is this dashed blue dot that starts basically from nothing and over time uh, grows to have about a, a quarter of the geographic concentration, while you'll see other areas in the Northeast are decreasing over time, right? So it's a story of basically the, the center of semiconductors moving, uh, you can argue slowly or not so slowly, from the East Coast out to the Bay Area, right? So this is again why, why we're interested in this particular region. What you'll see here is when we look at who's leading in semiconductors, um, early on, back when we're in the transistor early IC days, we've got a bunch of um, de novo entrants or, or folks who are actually going through and, and adding semiconductors to their portfolio, GERCA, et cetera. You also have Fairchild, which as we've mentioned earlier in the day, Fairchild is a spin-off of, of Shockley. So what we've done here is to show early on, you've got a bunch of incumbents who actually move into this space. As you move at the, uh, and look at the later top 10 leaders, right, vast majority of those are spinoffs themselves. Most come from Fairchild or a Fairchild spinoff. Uh, there are some anomalies there, but overall they really are the spinoff originator of the say second and third generation of spinoff uh, semiconductor firms in the valley. Okay. So we want to understand more about what causes this, why it's important, what, what implications there are, similar to some of the work that Ramel just uh, presented. And so in order to really understand this, we need a few things. We need to look at entry, survival, and growth and see what role do these spinoffs play uh, throughout that entire process, right? We know that there's an extraordinary growth of ex existing firms in the Valley and other places. We want to know, are there relocations of firms located from elsewhere who are moving to the Valley? Many people will talk about this fantastic environment, uh, you know, influenced by Stanford, influenced by others, just attracting a bunch of folks. We also want to understand what are the entry and success uh, variables of the new firms that are there, right? So these are three key things that we want to look into, and we want to test some predictions about firm entry and success, uh, both from an agglomeration perspective, as well as a heritage perspective around what firms do and what they will eventually go into uh, to help us understand the emergence of Silicon Valley. So I'll take you through the data coming up here, and then I'm going to uh, hand off to Francisco to go through a little bit more about the theory and some of the results that we have at this point. So in good Steven style. Um, 
we took a look at the IC industry and overall electronics from 1949 uh, until 1987 using a buyer's guide called the Electronics Buyer's Guide. Um, I know this book very well. I love them dearly. They're about two inches thick. Um, basically, it allowed us to, to collect information on all producers of integrated circuits, transistors, diodes, active modules, everything in the broad electronics industry, and build up an overall database of every single active producer in the United States in those about 40, 45 years. Okay? Um, we also collected exactly what products they were producing. So within diodes, for example, you're going to have 15 different types of diodes. We can track that over time. We can see how it's changing. We can also see what their spin-offs are doing to look at what they're doing over time. We then leveraged uh, data from Stephen, who had traced a lot of the firms listed on uh, a listing of top producers called ICE. He had traced the background of many of those firms. We also grabbed additional firms from what's called the Silicon Valley genealogy that visually will show you where these firms came from. Um, we also dug through trade journals, electronics news, and corporation records, web searches, et cetera, to build up an overall understanding of the backgrounds of of as many of these firms as we possibly could in terms of who was the founder, where did the founder previously work, et cetera. Uh, and then we went through and actually categorized and said, look, you're, you're in certain regions based on the, the Census Bureau's CMSAs. Okay? And we utilized this data as well as performance data to say, did you achieve, say, top 10 or top 50 status in terms of market share? As we looked through, okay, once you actually enter, how do you then perform um, to test the various hypotheses we're interested in? So digging into the data, and for those of you, I'm an engineer, a recovering engineer, I should say. Um, this, this may or may not be interesting, but there's a bunch of different technologies involved in integrated circuits, especially in the early days, right? So we are going to look at three types in particular, film-based, hybrid, which is putting a bunch of discrete components together onto a circuit, and then monolithic, which is where the entire circuit is made from a single slab of, in, in many cases, silicon. Right? And what we're going to see over time is monolithic is really the technological frontier. It's what you all have in your Macs and, and PCs on your desk uh, in terms of a single uh, chip. Right? So you'll see we look at who begins by producing only monolithic, only non-monolithic, which is going to be hybrid and film, and who actually produces both. And what you see with the tealish line is that between 65 and 86, monolithic clearly takes over and becomes the technological frontier. And that's going to be important as we look into the data to see, OK, when these firms enter, what do they actually do? Right? But keep that in mind that we're defining the technological frontier as monolithic integrated circuits, um, which are then produced by the industry. And I just talked through most of this. Uh, monolithic ICs we're using as the measure. You should know that Fairchild is one of the main pioneers in monolithic technology. TI is very, very close behind. Um, but Fairchild is, is the uh, pioneer as they, they go into this technology. OK. So let me just add a couple of things here also about the, the data. So this was this data that John collected, I mean, some of it already existed, but especially the one that, that John collected, was part of a National Science Foundation project um, that um, myself and, and Stephen um, were the co-PIs in. And the, one of the premises of that project is to make you know, some of this data available. And so we will finish organizing things and, and make it available. And I think that's also an important legacy because of the painstakingly detail and carefulness that Stephen also had going through this data. I mean, the process stopped a little bit for some time, mostly because, you know, uh, shortly after John uh, was finishing his PhD, he moved into McKinsey, and that has not left him much time to do research, you know, surprisingly. And I took administrative uh, responsibilities also around that time, which has not also given me much time to do um, research. And so things have not progressed um, a whole lot since, um, since John finished his thesis. But uh, we've since then um, joined forces with Cristobal, which was another uh, PhD student that worked with, with me and Stephen. And Cristobal um, is continuing as a faculty member. He's now back in Chile, in the Catholic University of Chile. And he is now you know, taking this effort uh, back and, 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 and really, you know, both developing into 
um, to get into, uh, you know, hopefully publishable papers, as well as to, you know, get the data organized in a way that could also be shared with, um, with the broader community. Because this data, as John mentioned, is basically has every single producer of starting with transistors, you know, and basically every single thing that we could find about their origins. Starting with transistors, moving into integrated circuits, starting basically in around 49 for transistors and then moving into 87 um, with a lot of detail on where these firms came from and what they were doing at the time of entry and over time. And so this, I think this is also a resource that we think and we hope that will be valuable beyond this. So getting into the specifics of, the, um, of, this, uh, of this paper that we've been building on, the idea is that when we think about clusters and most of what's been um, discussed, if you think about Stephen, obviously, in his mind and in his heart, there is a notion of heritage. There's general and historical work on heritage, meaning um, associated with the idea that firms enter in new areas that are related to what they've done before when a new opportunity emerges. And that's certainly you know, one of the basic ideas that are here, that you know, these firms will enter um, this, uh, this, these areas that are close by because they can apply their, their existing skill set and there's um, you know, already a, a long stream of work in this, uh, in this space. And then there's work by, by spin-offs. There's one particular way by which individuals take the knowledge that they've acquired in their previous um, uh, employer and really creates a firm um, uh, of, their, of their own. And so certainly one of the perspectives that's present very much here and uh, suggested by the important role that spin-offs had um, in, the, in, the, in the emergence of, of uh, Silicon Valley is this notion that heritage has certainly played a role, and we'd like to understand what role has heritage played in the evolution and the, and the establishment of, of Silicon Valley. And we've developed a set of hypotheses related to these. And so obviously the, the first set is, is much more established in the literature, is this idea that existing firms will have a high propensity to enter in related products. It's something that many people have looked at before. Um, and that obviously that may help so have a, an implication on performance in the sense that firms that have these relevant applicable technology are probably more likely to outperform others um, uh, following entry. And then there's the specific bit in which Stephen contributed a lot, which is the spin-off dimension uh, with the idea that, um, that obviously spin-offs are going to be doing you know, something that's close to what their parents have been doing, just like Ramel presented um, uh, very recently in his, his own, in his own presentation. And in particular, and this is linking back to the specifics of this industry that, uh, that John already alluded to, is that in, in particular spin-offs of monolithic producers are probably more likely to produce monolithic. And this is important because monolithic as, as John explained, is really the, the technological frontier and so it's an important benchmark for us to understand what was happening as the industry evolved in its early stages and then later on in terms of, in terms of uh, performance. Of course, that the other perspective that has been much more established in terms of the evolution of a cluster is you know, agglomeration theory. So this notion that there is some kind of geographic advantage from the co-location of firms. And this is anything, uh, obviously, starting with Marshall in 1920. It includes sharing of inputs, labor market pooling, and uh, knowledge spillovers. In, in, you know, with knowledge spillovers gaining much more preeminence in the literature lately, obviously, with, uh, with the uh, advances in technology that have, that have happened over the last uh, few years um, or decades, and, uh, and a lot more interest in this, in this, in this space uh, as, um, as people have done uh, research on this, uh, on this area. And so, obviously, the, the idea and the established perspective from this, um, from this theory is that, you know, being in a cluster is going something that's going to benefit the firms, both in terms of entry as well as in terms of its growth uh, and development. And out of these, we can also generate uh, sets of hypotheses that are, that are, you know, in line with, with what people that have been looking at clusters um, typically consider. So entrance in clusters may be more likely to also adopt, adopt the frontier technology because they are in that cluster and they will have access to this superior knowledge of being in that, in that cluster. Um, and firms that do not start with that frontier technology for whatever reason, it could be the, related to their legacy, to, their, to their, just their experimentation, are probably more likely to move to the frontier because they're located in this, in this cluster and they would get these benefits of being in an agglomerated region. 
And, and obviously, uh, there's also an implication on, for performance in terms of firms and clusters would be more likely to become leaders precisely because of the benefits of being in an agglomerated, in an agglomerated uh, region. So we've started to look at these things in terms of this very detailed data that we have. So the first thing has to do with, with, um, with entry and uh, in particular heritage. So because we know the backgrounds of these firms we c and we know also when they entered, we can have a pretty comprehensive view of what are these diversifiers. So the firms that have already been in the industry present or in general producers that entered the integrated circuit industry, where have they come from? What is their background and where have they entered? And the first set of results are interesting because one thing that this, this uh, shows is that they're not more likely to enter in this industry if they're located in a cluster rather than if they're located outside of one of, one of these clusters. And the four major clusters that we have here are the ones that John showed you before. This is where the industry was located earlier on and then later on, so Boston, LA, around New York and, and Silicon Valley. So the firms are not more likely uh, to enter in this industry, existing firms, um, but background does, make, uh, does play an important role. And so producers of silicon transistors are the ones that are more likely to enter into the production of integrated surface, and this is not surprising for, you know, given the previous results that exist in the literature about applicability of relevant and close by knowledge, and certainly silicon transistor producers are the ones that are closer to, um, to integrated circuits, and so this is not surprising. Perhaps the most surprising is the, the regional dimension. Then we, we go on and look at production at the technological frontier. So it's not, before going back, I mean, it's obviously, and John already showed this, that there was a lot of entry in Silicon Valley. And so I'm not, you know, show you any regression here about the, nature, the, the fact that there is more entry in Silicon Valley because that's very obvious. We don't need a regression to, to see this. The more interesting thing is about what do these people do once they enter, right? Because this starts to get more to what, what's going on in terms of this, this nanoeconomics perspective that Stephen so much um, cheered. Um, and pushed for, and what we see that if we look and if we consider this monolithic to be the frontier, we see that firms in Silicon Valley are more likely to enter at the technological frontier. And this doesn't go away if you consider the spin-offs of monolithic uh, producers. And so certainly that captures some of the coefficients of Silicon Valley, but it doesn't explain all of it. So firms in Silicon Valley do have a stronger likelihood to enter at the technological uh, frontier, and certainly if they're spin-offs of already monolithic producers. But what happens to firms that have not entered at the frontier? And the interesting thing here is that, that this is the regression that we have here with the hazard of switching into monolithic. We see that firms in Silicon Valley, or by the way, in any of the clusters, are not more likely to switch into the frontier if they not enter at the frontier. It's only the background, so if they were already a producer of transistors that seem to matter in terms of them actually shifting to the frontier, and you can see, looking at the percentages on the shares on the left-hand left -hand side um, uh, table there, you can see that the percentages are pretty small. And so you either start at the frontier, or very much, um, it's very much likely that you're not going to be able to make that switch, and, and if you did, it didn't, uh, it, there were not much of a benefit to be based on the cluster. And the final analysis is on the performance, right? It's so not only to move to the frontier, then let's look at what happens in terms of what performs better. And performance is important because down the line, we care about what happened in Silicon Valley, but in this broader context of what happened in the semiconductor industry. And what we can see here is that effectively, not surprisingly, Silicon Valley, firms in Silicon, Silicon Valley were the ones that outperformed the rest of the industry and the rest of the clusters. And so, um, as we can see very much there in the regression in terms of whether they attain the top level, the top level um, uh, performance in terms of sales, we see that Silicon Valley really stands out. But the interesting thing is that once we control for being a spin-off of a top 10 parent, then that Silicon Valley X performance or the performance of any other place um, in terms of one of the major clusters doesn't really stand out. And so it seems that background, and in particular, being a spin-off producer is really what makes a difference. So what are the conclusions? You know, these related diversifiers entered in ICs as we expected, and they entered throughout the US. There didn't seem to be any particular propensity for them to enter in one of, this, uh, of these clusters. 
we do see more entry of new firms, both spin-offs and the novo entrants in Silicon Valley, and more than the, the entry, they are likely to enter at the technological frontier, which is this monolithic, uh, monolithic integrated circuit uh, producers, but spin-offs seem to, be, to have been far more successful. You know, the novo firms typically were much more short-lived and none of them become a leader. And so it seems that these firms that were already established in one of these clusters don't seem to have found any kind of advantage to be in a cluster, even if that cluster was Silicon Valley. So this agglomeration, to the extent that we seek and we try to interpret these results, what they suggest is that these agglomeration effects seem to play a role, but these roles seem to be all associated to the entry dimension of the cluster. And so firms do tend to enter more at the frontier, and the spin-offs tend to happen more often in this cluster, and that seems to be the only mechanism by which you can explain the superior performance all the rest in terms of the presence in the cluster and outside of Silicon Valley does not seem to have influenced the likelihood of being one of the top producers or being a successful firm. And this points very much to something that we all know was very important and very dear to Stephen's um, um, work, which is the absolute importance of spin-offs. And I just wanted to end to say that if Stephen would have presented this, I can tell you that spin-offs would have been you know, much more preeminent here than some of the alternative perspectives on the evolution of these, uh, of these and other regions. Thank you very much. So uh, I'm not an engineer, and, and I, I haven't delved as deeply into the history of this industry as the you have. But uh, what I do know suggests that by 1987, there were some pretty important Japanese firms in this industry. Uh, they had uh, you know, uh, uh, staked out a fairly important part of uh, the, the product market. And I'm wondering where they would fit into your analysis. Uh, and if they're not there, then why? So perhaps luckily, the Electronics Buyers Guide ceased its publication in 1987. So we don't see a whole lot. We do see some uh, foreign no, no. firms. We do see some foreign firms who have established Silicon Valley locations by, say, the early 80s. Uh, but we don't see any real issues with uh, the offshoring of manufacturing through the fabulous firms, because that happens a bit later. And, no, and I'm talking about the based in Japan firms that were stealing market share in a significant way from the U.S. firms that are in their data. So, but I don't believe in the timeline we look at, any of them achieve, say, top 10 status. It's mostly in memory. Okay, another question? We'll the U.S. Out, out of the memory. Market. Um, there was one of, one of the central results you're highlighting about Silicon Valley firms more likely to enter the technological frontier that struck me as rather circular because you defined you define the technological frontier as the technology that came to dominate. Um, and suppose you had regional differences in the technology they chose. It seems almost logical that you would get your three asterisks on Silicon Valley enter the frontier more frequently. I, I, I don't understand what it is you thought you learned from that correct? Okay, so two things I'll also talk to, to um, this uh, point. I mean, the, the analysis stops in 1987, and most of our concern was not so much about, um, you know, it was more about the emergence of Silicon Valley vis-a-vis -vis what was happening in other regions of the U.S. And I don't think that the, the emergence of other, you know, uh, you know major uh, pr producers outside you know, you, we still have major producers, for example, Texas Instruments was a major producer. The question would have been, I think, if it would have been some kind of cluster that would have emerged in a particular region of Japan, and may, that have, may have been the case. And the question is, if that was the case, I'm not sure that it wouldn't have followed some kind of path. I mean, we would have to, it could be, we could undergo the same types of analysis by trying to understand where the original knowledge come from, and how did the the top firm and any you know subsequent firms that emerged um, developed, and what would the the role of the region versus the role of just them being, for example, spin-offs of each other, and so um, I think that that's 
certainly uh, uh, an important dimension of the evolution of the industry overall. I'm not sure it's something that would affect the our, our, our analysis in terms of trying to understand what was behind the emergence of Silicon Valley and the evolution of the of the industry um, over there. Um, certainly not until 1987, which is really when our analysis kind of stops. As to um, uh, Peter's uh, comment, uh, I mean, our, there are two things there, and that's why ultimately we, we care more about the performance dimension, you know, who attained some kind of top level status. Over there, our main interests were more, not, it's not so much the, the entry per se, was more to contrast that with the subsequent analysis related to the switching into the frontier. And so, overall, the nature, I mean, at that time, certainly within the scope of our, of our data, it wasn't evident, and we seem to have some, you know, anecdotal evidence for that, that didn't suggest that firms at that time were, were totally sure that monolithic was the way to go. In effect, for some time, it appeared that that was not the case. Uh, then, obviously, later on, that switch, that, that became much clearer. And so our idea was to say, you know, if firms are just trying on the way that they're trying to, they're entering, you know, what's the likelihood that they would have made the choice uh, to be at that technological frontier, you know, starting with. But most interesting, I think, we were wanting to establish that as a contrast to the subsequent regression, which is, okay, if you did not make that choice for whatever reason, you know, your previous history, you made the wrong bet, whatever, you know, is it, um, um, you know, is it true that being in the cluster is going to help you out to switch into that and to basically try to uh, take uh, advantage of that opportunity and really be, uh, you know, become one of the successful firms? And so it's in that conscious and in the fact that we don't seem to find that, that, uh, that we see the, the value of doing, of, of doing this analysis. You know, per se, without the other part, is probably, yeah, l less, um, uh, less interesting. And it probably would be, to, to show that, which has to do with the relationship, especially at the spin-off level, we probably go back to another analysis that we, don't, that we have that I didn't show here, just to show that what the spin-offs do is highly related with what their parents do, and, you know, and, and drop that part. So, but it was more to establish that, that contrast there and to show that at the entry there was something going on, but then after entry didn't seem that there was something uh, that, was, that was there. So we have uh, two more questions, you and then you, why don't we ask them, oh, there were three? Yeah. Okay, we'll try to ask all three and see how far you get. So let's go ahead. Yeah, I was just wondering, uh, do you exclude the possibility that agglomeration economies still matter? And let me just, uh, I will go there more into detail in my own presentation. But just uh, uh, one thing is, would you exclude the possibilities that spin-offs in clusters perform better than spin-offs in non-clusters? You didn't introduce an interaction variable in your analysis and you can only say and uh, conclude when you include an interaction variable. And you, I, I, I cannot recall if you included one. Okay, let's go ahead and ask There's a whole different category of spin-offs in Silicon Valley that I think are crucial. The first spin-off of Fairchild is an Apex Semiconductor, one, and, and it's, it's an engineer. He, they were not making devices, they were making silicon crystals and germanium crystals. There are equipment makers who spin off. There are, so all of these uh, inputs into the device manufacturers are locating nearby because they have to be nearby. Don't you think that would greatly influence the agglomeration effect? I mean, that, that, that you know, if the supply industry is there in terms of equipment and inputs, Okay. And I think my question's um, kind of related, but it, I don't, I, I'm not sure I understand your third hypothesis because um, it seems to me what it's saying is you're not going to see spinoffs head into new adjacent areas that the parent company is not in. And I can think of lots of cases in the history of technology where you know bike makers start auto firms or railroad signal makers create traffic signal companies or whatever. Like. And it seems okay. like your hypothesis is saying that's not going to happen. Okay. Well, thanks for, for all the questions. So, um, really quickly. So, that's absolutely the case. So, there, I just wanted to, it's broadly within the same area. So, in this case, that was just to relate to the idea that if your parent did monolithic, then you also did monolithic. It's a very high level. In effect, 
we have a very detailed analysis that shows exactly that the firms typically tend to enter in the same broad space, but in different narrow spaces. And we have actually very, very, that very detailed documentation of that, and we even have uh, a regression to show that that is the case. So you're absolutely right, and that's exactly what happens. Here, we're j the, our only concern was basically to establish the baseline against the opposite, which is to say, you know, they're spin-offs, but they're, they're not, what they do is nothing to do with what their parents did. They're just, it just, people just happen to work in the semiconductor industry. And that's, very, otherwise, then there's no heritage link, right? It's just, you just happen to be there. So that's really what we wanted to, to establish that, in effect, what the spin-off is doing is learning from what their parent, from what their parent is, uh, is doing. Now, uh, as related to what you were saying, that is precisely the point that, in some sense, is a little bit surprising in terms of the performance, because what we see is that a lot of our data and our analysis suggests that whether you made it to become a top firm has more to do with some entry conditions rather than what happened after, afterwards. So the extent that there is, so uh, it's not to say that, that there is not a value to, in terms of the agglomeration at that side, which actually relates also to the other question, the, the first question that came about whether that spin-offs may do better. So we have some difficulty identif identifying that because some of the, all, almost, I think, all of the top firms in, 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 uh, in, uh, in the cluster in the Silicon Valley end up being, being spin-offs. But the point here more is to see is that whatever seems to be happening seems to happen at the time of the formation, maybe them getting the right combination of people and everything in place to start with. Because that was the surprise about, you know, if once you exclude initial conditions, you seem to, to find a much harder time that a firm that is there that did not start the right way or the right path that tends to, that tends to, to, to do better. And you do have a bunch of other very good firms outside of Silicon Valley that, that, uh, that, perform, that perform very well regardless of, what they, of what, they, what they are. But we do have some difficulty on the identification just because of the nature of, of making certain claims because of the nature of, um, of, the, of, the, of the top firms in, in Silicon Valley, precisely. I actually was the first one this morning to upload his slides. Um, it's a great honor for me to be here, and it's also a great pleasure to be back at Carnegie Mellon, where I had the privilege of spending a postdoc year in um, which I enjoyed a lot. Um, my, the title of my presentation today is Towards a Nanoeconomic Approach to Innovation Systems. So I apologize for this being only remotely related to the um, title of the session, but what I, I'm doing here is um, very heavily indebted to Steve Klepper in many ways. It's work in progress and it's joint work with Anne-Kathrin Blankenberg, a student of mine. So, there's obviously quite a tension in this title. Um, nanoeconomics is, as we heard repeatedly today, is a term that Steve was quite fond of and um, which he once described as digging beneath the surface of markets to understand the forces that drive their formation and functioning. And what this meant to him, well, I think that was talked about so often today that I don't have to repeat a lot, reconstructing entire um, histories of industries, extremely detailed um, knowledge of the industry to start from, application of theory to derive testable uh, predictions, and then finally econometric analysis to test these predictions. In contrast, innovation systems is a term and a concept that Steve never liked. And um, when I proposed this title to David, he confessed to me that he doesn't like it at all, and I, I guess that makes two out of two, so probably the sample of people in the room who don't like it are even bigger. Now, I think, however, that the reason why Steve didn't like the concept of innovation system has less to do with um, what the core idea behind this concept is, namely that firms don't innovate in isolation, but they are part of a bigger environment that um, shapes their innovation, that helps shape their innovation activities, and that may also be um, in part shaped by them. And we, we heard about some of these elements of the environment uh, today. Firms that are vertically or horizontally related, firms in the same firm population, 
public research, policy, institutions, and so on. I think the, reason, the real reason why Steve didn't like the notion of innovation system has a lot to do with the type of well, work that is using um, the term, um, where when, and this is, I refer to some earlier criticisms here, so because it's not just my own position, um, one sometimes has the impression that the relevance of systemic interaction, which is basically the core claim of this innovation system literature, is often more postulated than actually shown. We have pretty little micro-level evidence often, and um, surprisingly, given the origins of the, of the concept, we know, don't know um, too much about how innovation systems evolve. Pretty sure I'm doing a lot of injustice here to single in contributions, but I think it's still fair to characterize the literature in um, the, the thrust of the literature as such. So what then if we were able to do nanoeconomics to look at innovation systems? Now that is basically what we are trying to get to in this, um, not in this paper necessarily, or this is just the first step, but in this um, work, to, as it were, approach innovation systems in a way that Steve might have approved of. <laughs> it's a challenge. <laughs> it's a challenge. So the objective would then be to understand the forces that drive their formation and functioning. And the approach would be to start from detailed knowledge of the empirical context. I think that is what, what is present in much of the work on innovation systems, but also go on, collect micro-level data for the relevant populations of agents, derive predictions um, about their interaction, and then try and test them. What I'm going to show today is not more than a first modest attempt into this direction. We work at the regional level, so we look at a regional in, or at regional innovation systems, and we do this for West German laser technology. This is another influence of Steve's because um, he was the one who uh, interested me in looking looking into this in, uh, in this industry, and then from there, we moved on to also look at other. Um, elements of, well, the environment of these firms. So the focus here is spe specifically on the interaction of regional firm populations, private sector innovation activities, and public research. So um, within this entire um, set of potential um, interactions within such an innovation system, the dimension that we're interested in is the link between public research and um, the firm population and the private sector innovation activities. And we try to operationalize, well, this is a word that I think, there's only Germans who use this word in English. We try to um, uh, understand systemic interaction uh, um, in terms of co-evolution. And if we indeed, in, in, indeed could show that um, different types of agents in these regional contexts mutually affected their development, then that might perhaps be consistent with a notion of systemic interaction. So um, this is what we try to do. We have data um, for various aspects of laser technology and laser manufacturing in Germany, firms, patents, publications, dissertations. Um, Background is a project that we have done over a couple of years um, which brought together economists as well as historians of technology. So we no do know a little about um, this um, technology that is based on original histori historiographic um, research. And the time span is pretty much the first 45 years of laser technology in Germany. And I will end with an, well, some initial econometric analysis at the level of planning regions. Said we are working uh, regional here. Planning regions in German are called Raumordnungsregionen. Very nice German word. Um, abbreviations are what? Okay. So why would we expect um, there to be mutual inter uh, there to be interaction and mutual effects of firms on um, public research and of public research on firms. Why would we then thus expect 
there to be coevolution. Well, we know, or at least a, a sizable literature suggests, that knowledge flows from universities to regional industry matter. And they might take um, a variety of conduits, collaborative and contract research, labor market mobility of students and researchers, also academic spin-offs, possibly also unmediated knowledge spillovers, but um, I'd be less sure about that one. And there's also substantial evidence suggesting that these are indeed um, localized. We also, oh, yeah. So if we take um, for granted for a minute that there's an interdependence between the firm population and the innovation activities, this literature would suggest that we have um, effects of public research both of in, uh, on innovation and possibly also directly on the firm population by entry of academic spin-offs. We also know from mostly um, historians of science and historians of technology that there is a high level um, reverse causality in that scientific advances often um, are dependent on technological change or are um, favored by technological change. We know um, from some other evidence that there may also be um, effects from industry on public research activities at lower levels, say because firms directly fund universities and public research activities. And if you, for someone coming from Europe, it's always telling to walk around an American university because there's many names on campus that suggest that this is uh, perhaps a relative conduit of um, support or of influences from firms on public research. Of course, um, collaborative and contract research works both ways. Um, we also have at least anecdotal evidence that firms may take influences on research agendas and curricula, and they may also lobby for research activities that are related to what they're doing. Um, there's less of a literature, but I think it's still plausible to expect that um, many of these processes are localized. So what this would suggest then is that we possibly also have relevant reverse causality from the firm population, from the innovation activities in firms to what is going on in public research. And if that were, were indeed the picture that we would get, that would, in my view at least, um, justify talking about systemic interaction or coevolution. So let's look at whether we have reason to believe that this is um, or has been going on in the German laser, in the context of the German laser industry and laser industry, uh, laser technology. And let me first present you some numbers and some historical um, evidence as regards the impact from public research on industry and innovation. We looked in earlier work um, at the extent of collaborative and contract research. Again, case study evidence suggests that in some cases this collaborative and contract research was extremely important for some breakthroughs, but if we look at the data that we have, it doesn't seem to be that pervasive. Um, university researchers were involved in just 3% of all laser firm patents, as best we can tell. University industry co-authorships account for less of 4% of all co-authored papers. That doesn't seem to be a lot, and that doesn't even talk yet about localization. We know that academic spin-offs um, played a role in this industry. They account for about one-fifth of all entrants. Um, on average, they didn't perform too well, but there's exceptions. And uh, when we looked at the training of doctoral students, that seemed to be the conduit that may have been more relevant than the other ones. We could identify in these 45 years, about 46 years, about 5,000 non-medical laser-related dissertations. Um, by the way, just 5,000 of these students became professors at German universities afterwards. So the majority of them ended up in the private sector, which is quite normal, at least in the German higher education system. And we looked for these former doctoral students on the um, patent, the laser-related patents. We could identify um, students as inventors on close to 5,000 corporate patents, which is about 28% of the entire laser source patents in Germany. So that may, may perhaps be a bit more. 
our, uh, our cooperation with these historians of science, uh, historians of technology, was quite helpful in getting some ideas about processes working the other way around. So um, we know that in a lot of instances, incumbent firms funded public research. That is not that surprising, perhaps. There's also very nice um, case study evidence showing how heavily incumbent firms lobbied for important research centers to be located in their own environment. And um, it turns out that you had, say, an important laser entrepreneur who was on the board of the Fraunhofer Society and who fought quite heavily for the important Fraunhofer Institute, which is this Fraunhofer ILT, to be located close to where his firm, to where his firm was, without success, though, in this case. And we also know from this research that incum incumbents lobbied heavily for large-scale R&D subsidies. And the ministry was quite open because they wanted to subsidize anyway, and it was quite helpful if the um, firms helped them legit legitimize what they wanted to do anyway. Okay. Um, finally, we try to um, at least begin to see whether there's quantitative, quantitative evidence that all this is relevant. And first, um, we looked at the entry risk, as it were, of universities to enter into laser research and whether this might reflect the presence of laser producers in the region. Obviously, this is not coevolution because we know that there's a lot of um, causality running the other way around, so there's a lot of issues here and we're not stopping here. This is just the first um, attempt to look at this. So we, de we define as the risk set all university departments in science and engineering in Germany and um, see whether um, those departments located in regions where there were more laser producers actually were faster in um, entering laser science. And some um, simple Cox regression suggest that, yes, um, there is some... Um, reason to believe that this was the case. It's um, very simple and not um, extremely uh, robust to controlling for other things. We wanted, event, uh, we wanted initially to find instruments, find some natural experiment to somehow deal with the endogeneity here. Um, all this has so far not been very successful, so we turned to something else which is uh, more popular in macroeconomics, but some work in industrial dynamics has also used this methodology. We run reduced form vector autoregressions. Sounds fancy, but just means that we have simple OLS um, regressions where we regress um, each of the interesting variables we have on its own lag values as well as the lag values of the other val uh, variables. And we just have three in here a proxy for, the, uh, for innovation, a proxy for public research, and the firm population size in the future. Do this in, firm, in first differences, or annual shares to um, deal with non-stationarity -station issues, and we do this with one to five legs um, to see whether this is just um, dependent on the leg structure. To actually run these models, we aggregate the public research variables that we have for at the university level. We aggregate those to the regional level and run this analysis at the um, level of these planning regions. And we also have to um, transform the information on finished projects, which we have in publications, dissertations, or, or patents, um, to ongoing projects. So we have um, levels of activity in the respective regions, and there we obviously have to make assumptions about the duration. So doing this, this is just an example of what this looks like for the simplest case where only one leg is taken into account. Interesting are the results of the uh, main diagonal that indicate um, if, they're, if they're fed, they're significant at the, at, at the 5% level. Um, they indicate that indeed there is um, a statistical association between these variables. Now, you cannot really interpret these coefficients, but what is typically done is to look for Granger causality to see whether uh, the lagged variables of one, uh, the, the lagged values of one variable 
um, help predict the current value of um, another variable. And this we did, these are just the p-values um, from Granger causality tests. And what I just want to show with this is that here, to um, keep it a bit more transparent, the main diagonal results are not in there. So there seems to be, um, indeed, Granger causality running um, in both ways, both from industry to public research and vice versa. So um, if you just, these are, in our view, the most interesting because least researched um, associations, either using publications as a measure of public research activities or in the right-hand panel using dissertations as the measure of public research activities there's some indication that um, the regional activity levels are indeed um, Granger caused at least by what is going on in the private sector in the respective region. Yeah, and the um, associations are stronger for the link between innovation and public research than they are for the link between firm population and public research. So, final slide. This is not more than some indication that there may be regional inter interdependencies consistent with the notion of coevolution in regional innovation systems. Um, I think one thing this shows that is that there is quite a bit of a bias in the, in the literature that um, very heavily looks at the effects of uh, university research, of public research on private sector activities, but there's much less research um, looking at the possibility of endogeneity or even controlling for potential endogeneity of public research activities. Um, and I think this indicates that there may be a bit of a problem. Obviously, we need to um, do a lot more work to understand the underlying processes. Um, we are not yet with this research at the stage where we can say, well, this is due to, say, um, doctoral students migrating to the private sector. This is due to collaboration and so on. So in that sense, this is not yet nano enough, definitely. It's obviously just exploratory results from a single industry. But I hope um, it can convey what we're trying to do here. And I hope that um, it can show that the nano economic approach can be extended beyond um, the evolution of narrowly defined industries and that Digging deeper beneath the surface is also useful here. Thanks a lot. And we hope that Steve will approve. <laughs> Why do you get convinced it? I'm not sure. Good question. Yes. So I think Stephen's story uh, about this uh, would have been there is one great firm made a one great university that by chance got located in one of those regions. And then everything kind of snowballed from there. And your order regressive approach, presumably applied to Detroit or Silicon Valley, would find a lot of range of causality between, not just between publications and uh, the University of Michigan will, be, will, 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 will certainly be there affecting the number of producers, the number of producers would be affecting the number of publications at the University of Michigan. But it will all be still driven by this process of you know, snowballing from the first great firm and, and all the spin-offs. So uh, you plan to really look into what's going on behind the emergence of those regions that are, or are, are you going to stop it, you know, all uh, I, I, the analysis? I, I couldn't resist to, to prepare this slide. <laughs> Even though I didn't, I didn't, I, I mean, I had it in an earlier version of the slides and I just deleted it. I think um, you're, you're totally, totally right. And I think when I first stumbled upon this when I was looking at um, the tire industry, because um, in reading the India, India Rubber Review, I read these stories about the University of Akron or Buchtel or Bachtel or whatever college as it was originally called, they entered into. Um, rubber research and 
quite a while after the industry was present. Quite a while after the rubber industry was present, quite a while after the tire industry was present with Mir Goodrich and the others who followed. So I think, yes, absolutely. This is, there may be cases probably where um, the university is first and starts the snowball effect. I would have a story to tell for that one as well. There may be other cases where the private sector, in this, uh, private sector activity is first. And um, I think these cases where the private sector activities are first are much more well, widespread than is typically acknowledged. When I told my friend Kuhn Franken, who was at Eindhoven at the time of this, he said, well, sure, the Technical University of Eindhoven is just there because Philips, and you can tell exactly the same story. I may have misunderstood your message, <clears throat> but what you're saying now is, is, is what Stephen would, would, would yeah. have agreed with. Yeah. What you presented in your paper, however, was sort of a, what is innovation, regional innovation system, that, 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 that is something that, that has a life of its own. And the point is, it's just like agglomeration economies, which it, they're hard to conceptually distinguish from heritage, but that was exactly what Stephen tried to do. So what you need to do is to see if there, if there is, is there this abstract innovation system, regional innovation system that matters, or is it still those, some, some you know, individual great universities or great firms that are at, at, the, at the bottom of all this? Well, a system is, to me at least, something that is made up, made up from components. And um, so there are, op the system as such is just a convenient fence around um, a collection of, of components. And perhaps them, they being in one geographic entity um, is is relevant because it's easier to interact within this geographic entity. And um, I think if you look at the mobility of, um, of human capital, or the restrictions to the geographic mobility of, of um, human capital, it may be relevant for the great firm to have this facility close by that breeds new human capital. We, we don't know that, and I'm not, I'm not saying this is, the system is more than the sum of its components. I don't know that yet, but I think we can approach this issue by taking an inspiration from the work on industry evolution. That's all that I try to argue. What? Uh, you know, very interesting, uh, a couple of points. Um, one, uh, again, I, I'd like to see the paper, uh, but I, I did some work a couple of years ago, a uh, paper called Lenser Prism and Management Science uh, that suggested patents are a horrible measure uh, for uh, the impact of um, public research on industrial uh, R&D, that there's systematic bias. Uh, it's not just going uh, to be given measurement and, and, and so on. Um, so it, 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 I could give you some tips mm -hmm. on how to make it a little better, but it's still not so good. Institutionally, though, uh, early work from e eons ago, th there's a tremendous uh, impact of industry on uh, universities. I mean, I think from, uh, you know, well, e even Nate Rosenberg's work uh, suggesting is uh, many here, including David and others know well, you know, fundamental, uh, fundamentally shaped by industry interests, the whole development here, Carnegie, material science, and so on. I mean, this is like enormous in talking about national systems of innovation, and I am very friendly to the idea, because the, the idea is how to understand how these different institutions interact. And then the question is, is do your analysis really get there, and what parts of it are you getting at versus, versus not. When I studied university and industry R&D centers with, with Rich Florida years ago, you know, they, they, very typically, uh, personnel in those centers would say, my God, that our interaction with the university, uh, with industry, was fundamental to shaping what research questions we were asking. Now, would that kind of interaction show up on a patent? Uh, 
And that's even begging the question of would the university researchers have patented it, what they got out of that anyway? Uh, uh, okay, particularly back then, though, okay. perhaps a bit more so today. So, so again, there's a range of these channels of interaction, and, and, and before it's speaking to the issue of regional systems or national systems, you know, you, you, you have to look at the different ways, and a lot of the early historical research is probably pretty helpful in that. That okay, before you interview, um, we're actually at time, so I have one more question, so I want you to respond to both at, at okay. once. Okay. So go ahead, you're the last question. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I don't know if this is the most helpful or even the most relevant comment, but maybe it's a comment on the history of ACRA. Uh, so 1908 happened to be the, the peak of the rubber boom, and it had the highest price of rubber ever. Mm -hmm. Like, the price of rubber has never recovered um, at all in, in, in 1911 in the crash, uh, I think it fell at least by a quarter of magnitude to um, incoming supply of rubber, mostly from, from Asia. Uh, and so um, I don't think that really, uh, I kind of agree with Sergey on his point, but that it, maybe that says something about how universities make decisions. <laughs> in, in, the, in the draft of the paper, there's, if I may start uh, with Brett, uh, Brett's question first. In the, in the paper, there's the longest footnote I've ever written. <laughs> and the footnote um, tries to show that um, the University of Akron entered into this research field because it was... Um, triggered basically by private sector, um, by, the, by people from the industry who told them, well, this might be a good idea, and who actually supported this quite a bit. So this is, and that they may be interested in this when the price of rubber is high, well, that, that's economics 101. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, patents, Wes, um, I think there I may not have been clear enough. We don't use patents um, to look at the, the, pri the public research activities. We actually um, try to make sure to get rid of all those patents in our data that are at least assigned to universities or public research um, organizations. In Germany, you always have to uh, no, um, talk about both. And we also looked at the inventor level to get a clear, clear measure of private sector innovation activities. We still have all the problems that, are, that I appreciate about the, the limitations of patents. Within industry, however, I think do, it's reasonably do safe to use them. Publications, co-authorships? Yeah. We're both. Yeah, we look at co-invented patents and co-authored um, yeah. publications. Okay. So we're going to have an announcement from David, but first let's uh, thank Guido again. Thank you.